Four horses could pull a pine log, but they had to pull together. Our oral history has been a passion of mine for nigh on 40 years. The stimulant for this was a reading of a book titled The Drifterman, written by David Butcher. This book is based mainly on the stories of herring fishermen operating out of Great Yarmouth on the east coast of England. These men's stories were tape recorded and transcribed verbatim, revealing their slang, their speech patterns and idiosyncratic phrases. Brought up on a sickening diet of early television sitcoms and soapies out of America, this was a method that really captured my imagination for the reality and substance of it all. It was a style used subsequently in four books, the last of which was The Hue and Pine Story, which I did in collaboration with Harry McDermott of Strong. Oral history has been discounted as being unreliable in some circles, as if everything in print is accurate. Having said that, it pays to do it with a good deal of scepticism. My strict policy is to use only first-hand accounts. Use hearsay at your peril. Film is the ultimate medium for recording oral history. People can tell us their stories and we can duplicate them in print, but we learn so much more by being able to see them and hear them. Their accents, their inflections, facial expressions and body language. He ducked his head and he grabbed me by the ribs and lifted me off my feet. I had these big teeth marks in me for months. These men and women are of another age and their like will never be seen again. Well, he would have been the top horse driver on the West Coast in uh, the Millers, who have gangs in the, in the Gordon. With horse teams, they would... Uh, nothing like that to, to get Jack Crane to, to go and drive their teams or look after their horse, horses. He was excellent. Actually, he never... I worked with Dad for years, from about 13, I think I started in the bush with him. And to see that fella uh, handle horses, to drive horses, he, he, he didn't have to drive horses. He, he could be half a, a couple of hundred yards away putting skids in the head of the horse team and he'd whistle. And I could be standing behind him and, and, and the leader would nudge like, give a few nudges and away they'd go. He didn't have to drive them. They knew him and uh, he was a... Uh, he was excellent with horses. They just... I seen him down at Pine Cove. He, he, he had gone down there to relieve uh, Harry Smith, the horse driver at the time. And he went down there three months relieving. And, uh, and then he came back to Strawn. And I went down to Pine Cove to work as a... As a 14 year old as a stable boy. And uh, Dad came down with Mr. George Smith, who was the uh, boss at the time. And, uh, and the horse drivers, what was, was there working there, they hadn't got any logs out to the beach, there was nothing. And Mr. Smith said to Dad, Come on out, would you come out and out the road and see where they are? So we get to this hill and we could hear these people. Jokers yelling and hollering and swearing and going on. And here they are with this nine horses hooked to one log and they got half, about halfway up this hill and they couldn't get any further. And Mr Smith asked Dad if he'd help out. And Dad said, well, you'll have to go and ask the horse driver down there if I can do it. And he said, right oh. And he come back and he said, yes. They said, if you can get a log to the beach, you're a good one. So Dad said, well, we'll take five of those, four of those horses off and uh, we'll just use five. So he went and picked his five horses out and put them in the team where he wanted them. And as he went along them, the horses knew him. They just smelt him and you could see that they, and he just spoke to them. And you could see their ears wiggling and just sniff him and that. He run his hand along him and then he just stood on the bank and he just whistled. And they just flattened out like one horse and away they went. 
And these jokers said, well, we've heard of Jack Crane, but by God, I've never seen nothing like that. Yeah, it was just way to went like one. And that's what he could do with a team of horses. No sore shoulders, no crooked feet or anything with him. Everything was, yeah, horses were beautiful, looked after. I often mention Bobby Crane's father as a real teamster and he had a beautiful leader, a big black horse. And do you know, in cases like that, them horses smells, they smell you. And they know if you're friendly to them. You can tell by the look in their, their face. And the, their, it's, a, it, it's a companionship between horse and man as to whether he'll give you his best efforts or not. I'm sure of that. That Jack Crane, Bobby's father, he could do anything with a horse and all the horses, if it was a strange horse, used to smell him. Yeah. And he'd speak to them in a language I didn't think that they really understood him. You had to learn or you got to kick up the backside. You was taught one mistake, you was allowed one mistake, and you couldn't repeat that one second time. I went out to the King with Dad when I was 13, out to out nearly to where the dam, Crotty Dam is now. We pulled Ewan Pine from under Mount Uxley and about a mile, and then we shot it down over into the King River. And that, when floods had come, to be washed down to the sawmill at uh, Loana. Mr. Jones's mill there. Uh, from there, I think I went to the Gordon. Uh, no, Pine Cove. Yes, worked in Pine Cove, and that's the, where I tell you. And I ended up horse driving there. I was driving the three horse team there. Then I went to the Gordon from there. Cameron's Flat, that's uh, along the Lime Kill Reach, the big long straight in the Gordon, pulling King Billy. Fine there. To me it looks like the creek there well, uh, where we used to get our fresh water from. Uh, I'd say this was the place. Yeah, where the camps and stable was, was all cleared out for firewood for the camps and uh, etc. Uh, the uh, since that time, this, this bush has all grown up, plus the blackwood trees and some of the myrtle. Some of the myrtle was log, but not, not a great deal, only very selective logging. And I noticed a lot of the old ones uh, of uh, that time has fell down and rotted away. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a billabung runs around the back there, and the shoe road went around behind that back up under the, the range is where we got the King Billy. But you can see where the, uh, the formation would come through those trees. There was a uh, five team and a four horse team pulled quite, quite big logs. Some of the smaller logs was even towed behind one another. Uh, probably two. Two to three logs, smaller logs, would be hooked behind one another and pulled along. That would have been trenched out a lot more than it shows here. Coming over the myrtle roots and everything. Uh, takes me back a long way. Yeah. I was only a kid then. I wish it was the same now. <laughs> And I uh, went from there to back to Spring Creek, which isn't very far up the river from the mouth, six or seven miles or something, and uh, putting King Billy in there. And I uh, put it back in, uh, we'd pulled about five mile and put it in the creek there, it flowed out to the river. Horses was never drove or reins or anything like that. They were drove by command from the horse driver. It was, uh, come here, sung out in very strong language, we come here, to the left, 
Woe G back to the right. Or woe to stop. Get up, you so and so to, to start. Or, as Dad used to do, nothing but a whistle. And they would uh, follow at the, the right commands. Uh, horses are very intelligent animals, you know that. Yeah, you know about them. And if you look after a horse, as he's supposed to be looked after, they'll treat you with respect too. In the very early 1920s, Roy Nielsen's father, Victor, was in charge of a logging operation at the Braddon River, which flows into the Macquarie Harbour. He was working for the Pine Export Company, who operated a sawmill in Strawn. Uh, they knew their position of where they were, whether they were in the front of the steam or, or not. A good leader, a good leader, he won't let another horse take his place, really, or your bite or anything. Yes. And I oh, don't know, they know their place. Uh, when it used to get dark in the Braddon, you know, I think I might have mentioned before, all we had to do, us kids, uh, the old fella would leg us up onto a horse each. And, the, and, and it'd be real dark in the bush. The horse would find his way home. Stepping over logs and different things, he'd be heading for the stable. Yeah, that was, that was how it was. Good. But of course, uh, with, along that particular line, with horses and their leaders, four horses could pull a pine log, but they had to pull together. And you can't always get them to pull together. You've got to be a good team to get them to pull together. And just how did you do that, Roy? Get him to first one to... Well, this is what they used to do. Now, this Jack Crane and Claude Morrison, that stand alongside of their leading horse. And they just speak to him quietly, stand up for whatever they And then when they wanted him to pull, it was sometimes a whistle, a sharp whistle they used to do. The leader would take a strain. The other horses would see it or feel it, and then they'd take a strain and away they'd go. But if you never had that coordination, you'd have one horse pulling one after the other. They'd get frightened if they thought they'd going to be punished for it. Now you're in trouble. You had to get those team of horses to work as a team and, and, and you could do anything with them. One of the horses we had in, in the Gordon River uh, it was, uh, I can't really tell you, a, a fellow had hit it in the head with a axe. Cruel mongrel he was. And had, a, had a print of the back of the axe in his forehead. And, uh, and we, we had this horse, in, or Dad had it, in his team. And I don't know whether it used to suffer with headaches or what the poor bugger. But it was always in good nick. I used to look after the damn thing. But Dad could put it in the team and everything and do any. And if I'd feed it of a night and carry bloody water, oh shit, <laughs> carry water to it and everything, as well as the other horses, but to go and put a box of chaff in its manger, I'd have to go in alongside the, the horse alongside of it and climb through the rails. If I went in, it would kick me out of the back of the stable or try to crush me up against the... And one day at the top of the chute, where we used to pull logs and, and to the top of a cliff and, and we'd uh, roll the logs over the bank and they'd go down a big chute down, down the hill. And I went to hook the horse, the, this leader's reins up over a snag uh, on the side of the bank and when I did, he ducked his head and he grabbed me by the ribs and lifted me off my feet. I had these big teeth marks in me for months. But that's what, no one, any, anybody going to the stable, he, that's what he had tried to do, but Dad could do anything with him. 
And I don't know whether he had a hate on anybody after this fella hit him in the head with axe or what it was. Dad had a short. He, he was the one in, in the rear of the team, the last horse in the team. And uh, he going round corners, if he never had any brains or anything like that, and other horses, three or four horses in ahead of him, and they'd drag him in onto the banks and that sort of thing. And he'd have to take the whole load around a short corner. He'd lift it into one of and lean over. And, and the horses ahead of him, he'd, he'd bite the next horse to get him out of the road if it wasn't quick enough. And once he got around the corner, he'd just relax. And Dad used to say to me, now look at that. This horse, he had a trooper, his name was. Jeez, you've got a beautiful nag. He'd say, now look at that. These so-and-so horse drivers had belt him, reckon he's loafing. He just letting the others take, a, take the weight while he's getting ready for the next corner. And that's what he'd do. He'd, he'd take a bit of the weight, but he'd ease up and get ready for the next corner. He had to go. Well, otherwise, they'd drag him up onto the bank and into the... When we finished down at, uh, finished working the King Billy at Spring Creek, we had to travel the horses back to Cameron's Flat, which is from six mile up the river to about 20. It was a great big bend in the river. And, uh, and uh, well, why? That's good. That's good. Great big bend in the river, for it's not far, not all that far from six mile up the river to 20 mile. So it was from where the where we was logging at the end of the the Spring Creek Road, we was able to travel the horses about on a traverse track across to the Cameron's Flat job which was about three mile, and we was able to travel the horses uh, to Cameron's Flat, the only place we could load them on the boat. They was brought up on the, on the old gun die. We had about eight at that time. Yeah. So we had to drive them. Uh, uh, we uh, built. We had to build a bridge, sort of a couple of spars and some planks and whatever, to walk them across from the bank to the deck of the gun die, uh, and sort of scramble them down there and down onto the deck, and they had to uh, travel them to Strawn from there. We came down the river, it was funny, I can't think of this old skipper's name. Uh, we had a nickname, we kind of, it was a bit blind. And we were coming down all the way from up Cameron's Flat and, and we had a pull up uh, <coughs> opposite Spring Creek to get our, our gear, we'd roll in with the, the dinghy and pick our gear up off the bank and take it out the gun line. And he sort of couldn't pull her up or steer or some damn thing. He was crashing through the pine heads and nearly swept the horses off the deck and all. <laughs> it was a turnout. I can't know, Captain Jolly, I think his name was. Anyway, uh, we got to Strawn, all right. One of the most... Uh, was coming up out of a uh, terrible steep up out of Pine, where he used to pull them from top end of Pine Creek to get them to the beach. So there was a fairly steep hills. And one particular place was um, around this gravelly corner, very hard. And uh, as I say, Dad, well, sometimes we'd have to take one horse off the other three teams to help each one in difficult places. So I might take one of my horses and hook it on to Dad's or he'd bring the other team, one of the other horses back from another team. And uh, this particular day, he had this big ewing pine. It was a tremendous, very huge, huge one, and it was hard. And uh, they get to this damn corner, and uh, this, to stop the two, the shoe horses being pulled up onto the bank, he'd have to hook the other. The lead teams over onto his one chain, so he, he, he was uh, wouldn't pull him so much over. And, and this big horse called Duke, oh, he's a bit of a mad sort of a thing he was, but he's a great, big, powerful mongrel. And uh, 
And when he, he spelled the horses and set them all up to go round this bend, in a cold day, and, uh, and when they started to pull around and, and, and they're flat out as one horse, the six horses, and the stones was flying from their hooves and the big jaw horses laying out and giving his best. And it was, abs if you could have seen it, it was absolutely amazing to see those horses doing that with this damn great pine. Because once he got around the bend, just a wall. Stopped him, give him a blow, and rearranged his team again. And away they went. But it was something terrific to watch those horses that day in that particular, in that particular thing. It always stuck in my mind to see that. Yeah. The food for the horses, everything had to be taken in by boat to uh, to uh, to the to the Gordon, and uh, you had chaff, chaff, big bags of chaff, oats and bran to be mixed together in their feed. When when the horses worked in the Gordon River and all, anywhere on the Yawn Pine, to my knowledge, there was no there was no green feed. Horse to work horses all in Ewan Pine. There was no paddocks of green feed or pasture for them. So they had brand, oil cake, and uh, this is part of their diet. And brand, oil cake, and their main diet was oats and chaff and stuff. And about every fortnight or so, if you kept your eye on them, the horses, and their manure was that hard you can only lay a road. Like it's like when they you could kick it about and throw it around like bloody lumps of rock. Well, if it got too hard, you'd give them a pound of Epsom salts, and that would clean them out. That was horses. That's the stomach part. And as for their feet, well, my experience of that was you had a pen knife for the good... You had to have a pen knife for the good uh, narrow wire, not a the narrow pen knife, not a bloody wide one. Narrow, like a thin and thin. And you tapped the hoof, and you found the horse. The moment you tapped where it was, where he was jarred, he'd have a jarred hoof through through working in the stones. Their shoes didn't last very long; they had to be shod pretty regular, and there were no trouble to shoe, providing they didn't have sore feet. And that was a bit of a bugger, a bit of a problem. But uh, I had a little bit to do with it, and not a lot to do with the horses. But I did shoe them, and I had a bit of that experience. Bloody, it was a bit of short, but good. And this particular case, one horse he had, he couldn't get his foot, couldn't get him to come good, and we kept tapping him. And Harry Smith said to me, Ron, he said, I think we better try to let, find out where the trouble is in that hoof. So he got it up, and Harry held him, and I turned the knife around and around and around, and bored a bloody hole in his hoof, and out come all the matter, you know, the rubbish. And when it did, we washed him out with kerosene and plugged it with a bit of uh, plugged it up with a bit of uh, clean rag or well, no rag, any rag in it, and put the shoe on top of it. And we had the horse to work. In a couple of days, he's back at work, and we he was lame for a bloody oh, nearly a fortnight. Couldn't bloody walk. Poor bugger's hoof was all it all fested up in under the shell, in the shell of the hoof, and we went up through it and let it out, just like fingernail in the. Now that's right. That did happen. That did happen. That happened. That happened at Pine Cove. There was a lot in it, a lot of work, hard work, standing shoes in the mud, up to your knees in the mud. And, uh, yeah, the slippery ground on the, on the steep hills, you're coming down, the horses have to be full gallop at times to keep out of the way of the, the, the log running up onto them. Some places you had to use what was called a rough chain. Uh, you'd stop on the top of the hill, lay a big chain, heavy chain out, pull the log up to nearly the centre of it and, and run the end of the, through a big link and dog it in further along the log. And, and that chain act as a, as a uh, drag to stop the log from shooting so fast, running so fast. 
Uh, being a, a, a teamster, you had to be capable of shoeing your own horses. So you had to have a little forge of some description. It seemed to be essential for a little hand forge or some way to warm your shoes up. That seemed to be the usual thing when you shoed your horse. You'd cut his hoof, hoof to a certain extent, then you finished up by getting the shoe nice and red and burning it on to get a nice uh, a fit. A couple of horseshoes here, friends. They look like big horseshoes, are they? Oh, well, they're not super big like the big Clydesdales, no. They're, they used a, the draft horses here, they're like a quarter draft horse, they were light legged. Yeah. And um, so they could pick up their feet over the logs and rough ground, and they were faster as well, but probably not as strong as a full Clydesdale. Uh huh. Yeah. Where'd the family get them? Oh, they're still getting them from all over the place up the northwest coast. Yep. I see a, a docket there that old Jim, <coughs> the grandfather, he brought two horses in Launceston and he walked them to Strawn in the early 30s. He walked them from yeah. Lonnie to Strawn. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I reckon we've got it hard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there'd be a forge, a little forge, possibly an old anvil or a piece of railway iron to act as an... Uh, uh, an anvil, <clears throat> there'd be chains laying around, there'd be what you call log shoes, uh, which was a piece of mild steel, wide enough for your, to, for your log to sit on so as he'd have a rounded front on him and, and jump over logs or rocks or anything like that. And if you didn't look after your horses correctly and have those things done, they got sore shoulders and that sort of thing. Uh, it was terrible to see horses with sore shoulders trying to pull. Uh, and my father would never have an horse in that sort of uh, condition. They always had to be nicely polished up look well and no scars or marks on them. He was an expert. In the cuttings where the logs had trenched it out, uh, over the years they got it real deep, now 20 feet deep, trench, uh, trenching it out. And they eventually caught it with big gum slabs and it was pretty steep, and, uh, steep down. And when those frost came and froze all the bottom of the cuttings and the logs would shoot real fast and the horses would have to go full gallop ahead of them to stop the, the logs from running up on them. And uh, sometimes the logs would come unhooked and the teams would still keep going. You'd be running down along the bank, up on the bank yelling, whoa, 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 but they'd keep going, going until they got there. Then you'd have to, you couldn't lead one back and turn him around to hook onto the, the logs or anything to start him up again where they'd stop running. You'd have to back the damn horse up the slippery cutting. It was a bug of a job to try and back him up, sliding and slipping to get back to hook onto the log. Enough to start it to go down again. And there was a dreadful lot of frost at that time, all the, all the bay was frozen over. The seagulls used to come down to, they, they didn't know the ice was there, they'd come down to land on the ice and they'd skid, thinking they'd little land on the water. But it was that, oh yeah, it's real froze up. That was 1936.